السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. ما شاء الله. الحمد لله. Anything you would say at this point to try to express our happiness in seeing the people that we dearly love and that we hope that are connected to not only in this world but the next. At this point, we're not truly convey the feeling in the heart. Ma sha Allah, alhamdulillah. And um, ma sha Allah, this room keeps getting more and more beautiful every time that we come in it. Ma sha Allah. Allah Jamil Rifat Jamal. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is that beautiful, and He loves beauty. And uh, the outward manifestations of beauty is that, that if they are looked at correctly, is that they help with inner manifestations of beauty. And that everything, <clears throat> every sense of the human being that recognizes that beauty in accordance with that particular sense. And so that there is a beauty that the eye recognizes, there's a beauty that the sense that we smell recognizes, there's a beauty that in relation to sounds that the ear recognizes, there's a beauty in relation to that, that which we touch and the things that we deem to be beauty, all of the five senses. But the heart also perceives beauty. And um, the two reasons that people love ultimately that get back to that perfection and that get back to ihsan. So that we naturally are that created to that love and to that be connected to <coughs> that which is that beautiful or complete in and of itself. And likewise is that when good is done to us. And that we could talk about those meanings in relationship to our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also in terms of our Prophet sallallahu that no one was more beautiful and complete than he was sallallahu alayhi wa And that we can talk about three degrees of that beauty. His beauty of his physical body sallallahu alayhi wa his beauty of his that character sallallahu alayhi wa and that his also inward spiritual beauty and the reality of his true nature of his that Muhammad in nature of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which was the most beautiful thing of all, is that were the veil to be removed to someone to see even the slightest bit of the internal light and beauty of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we would be unable to bear it. If we have certain athar that indicates is that were the light of the disobedient believer to be unveiled, is that it would fill up that which is between the heavens and the earth. Then what about the the obedient believer, what about the righteous, what about the awliya, what about the elect of the awliya, what about a prophet, what about the ulul azim and al what about Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu you can only imagine what is internal beauty that would have been like. And then, in terms of ihsan, is that when we think about everything that our prophet did sallallahu alayhi wa and that the bearing of the trust of revelation, and that assuming that trust and passing it on, and the four foundational attributes that we attribute to the prophets and messengers is that we know that they had a manner, that they were trustworthy, we know that they had sidq, that they were truthful, and we know that they did what was called tabligh or risala, that they conveyed the message, just as we know that they also had fatana, they also had that sagaciousness, that a mental keenness, and an intelligence that was appropriate for a prophet and that when you think about everything that the Prophet did for us and all of the burdens that he bore on our behalf وسلم, how could you have anything other than the love for our Prophet وسلم, in our hearts? Um, inshallah we'll speak a little bit tonight about healing and in particular healing of the hearts and healing of the soul and um, I thought it would be good to approach this topic in the following way because that there is tendencies now within certain communities, especially those who tend to deny the divine impact of our creation and disbelief in our Lord, to look outwardly at the way things are and put them into question based upon the way they are. And the nature of the believer is that when we look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation, is that we want to see the meaning behind it. As the poet said, in the Indeed, that everything that is existing in creation is that they are meanings set up in the form of images. And that everyone who realizes this is that truly a person of intelligence. And so, is that one of the words that we have for learning lessons is the word i'tibar. 
is to take a lesson from something. And it relates to avara yavara, which is to cross. And so the idea is crossing that the obstacles that might be in the way for someone to understand that meaning. And that oftentimes that people get veiled by the outward form of things, and they tend to that lack an ability to understand the meaning that is behind it. And you could look at it in the following way, yeah, that when we talk about healing, is that as if that our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the creation so that is in need of healing at every single level. You could start at the level of the cosmos in that interpret a verse like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, halikun illa wajah. That everything is perishing that except his noble countenance. And so that the universe itself has been set up to ultimately that lead towards non-existence. It's going to end some way. Now, whether it's just going to keep expanding, keep expanding, keep expanding so that it cools down and then that's it, or whether it's going to continue to expand and then fold up on itself, or whatever else is postulated about the creation of the universe and how it's going to end, that ultimately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control. And just as that we weren't there to witness the beginning of creation, that Allah ta'ala says that مَا أَشْهَدْتُهُمْ خَلْقَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ We did not cause them to witness the creation of the heavens and the earth. Likewise, is that we don't know exactly that from our perspective, other than what has been, we've been told in the Quran, how that is going to happen. But we know this is the nature of creation, is that everything, كُلُّ شَيْءٍ Everything is hack, right? And that it is perishing, it is moving into non-existence. And that is a very profound verse. And that you could look at that over, in an overarching sense, in relation to the, how we experience time, just as you could look at it, in that the moment to moment, as that everything in reality is being that created and recreated, created and recreated, created and recreated. And that by its nature, that the world in and of itself was not meant to be here permanently. And then that you could look at this at the civilizational level, is that we, that people have studied in great detail, the rise and fall of civilizations. Every civilization that rises, 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 and then it eventually falls. This is the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. At the civilizational level, is that there are, is a rising of a civilization and a falling of a civilization. And then you could see this at the societal dimension. And when you start to get here, that you could look at this idea of entropy and the natural state of things to move into a state of disarray at not only the societal level, which is also made up of individuals, but especially at the individual level, is that if you do not put that energy in to better society, is that it will decay in and of itself, that it will move towards that disarray in, all of, in a number of different ways. And this is definitely the, the statement when it comes to the individual, is that, that whether it be our physical health or whether it be our spiritual health, is that you have to put energy in constantly to maintain your physical health, is that you have to put energy in constantly <coughs> to maintain your spiritual health. Otherwise, it will move towards a state of disarray. And after understanding how this all works, which is all pretty straightforward, is that what we can conclude from that is, it is as if our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala has set us up to be in need of healing constantly. And in that regard, you could look at it in one of two ways. You could look at it like someone like Ray Kurzweil, who is one of the that, Billah, that worst people that I've ever heard speak on that something of this that is that deeply that entrenched in a worldview of Kufr, that will say ridiculous things that I don't even want to repeat. The upshot of it is, is that a complete sheer disrespect for our Lord and the way that he created things, and that saying ridiculous things like, how, how could I respect the human body that when it's so flawed and it can get sick, completely that being blinded to the wisdom in the whole process. It is as if that Allah Ta'ala is setting us up a need for healing so that we can realize the truth of the matter is that we are in absolute need of Him in every single moment. And once you realize that, that we are in absolute need of Allah, is that now you can actually start healing in the true sense of the word. 
as long as that we have this that illusory understanding, <coughs> we are deluded by our particular state and how we experience the world, and that we are cut off from that meaning of realizing that we are in absolute need of our Lord in every single that moment, that it's very difficult for us to progress. So then this begs the next question, is that how do you and I fight this spiritual entropy? So the purpose tonight is to not to focus on physical health, although that is a very, very important topic. It's more to focus on the spiritual dimension of the human being in relation to healing to this of the soul. What can we do? What in type of energy that can we put in to that start this process? And here we can look at a that section of Imam Ghazali's Ihyanu Medin that is taken from the Book of Intention, Sincerity, and Truthfulness, where that after defining what, you, what, he, what is called Sidq, which is truthfulness, is that he gives us six different levels of truthfulness. And that is important to, to note here, and this is amazing the way the Imam Ghazali does this, is that he just as he combines vices together, and shows <clears throat> how they relate one to another. Likewise, he combines virtues. Uh, so over the weekend when we were in Aptos, we were looking at the relationship of Ghadab to Hiqad to Hasid. How that anger, when it is uncontrollable, and it gets the best of one, can turn into Hiqad, which is rancor, which if you don't uproot that from your heart, is that it could turn into Hasad, which is envy, and that those three vices all relate to another. And that if one's not careful, one leads to another, which leads to another, and opens up all different types of sub vices that can completely that overtake one, I would be that and lead one to, and, and put them in a very bad state. Um, but likewise, <coughs> excuse me, the virtues also are related to each other. And so the intention is related to sincerity, and sincerity is related to truthfulness. And how does that work? Is that the intention is where we scrutinize all of the things that we should be intending, or whereas you could say, those things that motivate us, of all of the different possible motivations, what are the ones that will actually be sincere and pleasing to Allah? But the difference between the ikhlas and sin. <clears throat> Sin, uh, truth, sincerity and truthfulness is that all truthfulness, all sincerity is truthfulness, but not all truthfulness is sincerity. In other words, is that truthfulness is a virtue beyond sincerity. And sincerity relates to that particular moment that you make the right intention and you have the right motivation. But you could be mukhlas, but you might not be salat. You could be sincere, but be lacking truthfulness. And when we say truthfulness, it doesn't really convey the meaning of sit fully. Because it, we only think of, when we say truthfulness, one type of it, which is actually its lowest degree, which we'll talk about in a moment. So every person who is mukhlas is not necessarily a sadaq, but every sadaq is definitely mukhlas. So then he was a list for us the six degrees of sit. And he bases it on part of hadith of our Prophet Sallallahu which indicates about righteousness, he speaks of, and how that truthfulness leads to righteousness, and righteousness leads to paradise. And then he said, a servant will continuously be sincere, uh, will continuously be truthful until that he is written with Allah as a siddiq. And based upon this hadith, is that we realize is that there is a that first degree, beginning, foundational degree of truthfulness, and then there's a path that one takes that leads them in the highest degree. And that after the prophets and messengers, according to the Quran, is that we know whoever obeys Allah and his messenger, they will be with those that Allah has bestowed his favor upon from amongst the prophets, the Siddiqeen, those highest saints, or however you choose to translate it, the, that um, you could say ultimate confirmers of truth, however it is that you choose to translate that, and then we have the Shuhada, who are the martyrs, and then 
the righteous. After the prophets and messengers, this is the elect of the elect. And that this is one of the reasons why the epithet of Sayyidina Abu Bakr is a Sadiq, is that he was truthful to Allah in all of his different states. And that this is also that in the nomenclature of the righteous, the word that they use for the very highest station of all that they refer to as the maqam al siddiqi al kufr And you find this in the books of the scholars. And it is the station of the greatest siddiqiyya. And the reason we should speak about these things, even though that where are we from them, is that it's important to know them. Even if we are not necessarily from them, we should speak about it so that we can know, know that it exists, so that we can come to love them. And that love in and of itself is beneficial in the dunya and the akhirah. Secondly, is that if you don't know there's something higher to attain, how are you going to better yourself in the first place? Is it, it's good to know that, okay, there is a lofty goal that is out there that perhaps someone can possibly attain so that you can then have the requisite spiritual aspiration to at least that tread the path that if you can't attain that entire thing is that you've gone as far as that you can. And so the first degree starts with Sidq al -lisan. And again, we're presenting this in the following context, that of that how can you and I fight spiritual entropy? Because if you neglect yourself, is that the nafs and amara basu will take you in a direction that is that unhealthy for you. There's no doubt about that. And there is no neutrality at the level of the soul. You're never ever just remaining that stagnant. You are either increasing or you are decreasing. You are either ascending or you are descending. <coughs> And that this, the proof of that is, is that chapter that we've all heard that Imam Shafi said for this to be the only chapter that Allah revealed it would suffice with Asli in the inside of the Fusul. That relating us to time, by time indeed that human beings are in loss, illa, and then there's an exception. So what we need to do is to learn to live that exception. And how do we do that? It's in the following way. The first way starts with the first degree of sidq is sidq al being truthful in the things that we say. And even though this is a that long discussion in and of itself, all of the various things that one might potentially say, that even though that they're not outright lies, but they that might not be the whole truth either. And that um, when I was speaking earlier about how oftentimes is that we just repeat things that we hear without fully checking them out and we forget the hadith of our Prophet Sallallahu that kafab and mani kadiban and you hadith bi kudi masama. It is sufficient to be considered a liar is that everything that you hear you just you just say it. And social media does not help too much in that either. And people say things and then that they share those posts and then all of a sudden it is across the world and it's been completely decontextualized. And that unfortunately, that people's honors are at stake and people get hurt. And just because you're behind a computer and you're tapping a button and you don't think because you're not seeing the reaction of someone before you, that you're not harming someone or somehow that you're not taking into account for that, a'udhu billah, is that your tongue is, in your pen, is one of the two lisans. And by extension, that the modern pen is the typing of the letters or whatever it is that you're doing on the computer. It's an extension of that what would normally, the way that people used to that write with pens, it's an extension of that. And you are absolutely taken into account for that before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And um, this is a very, very dangerous state. And unfortunately, is that if you tell people that when they're typing to have taqwa, right, this is not something that people tend to think about is that to just pause and reflect upon what it is that I'm going to say. Right? At very least, and there's someone that just mentioned to, this to me recently, is that, that he defended someone and then people didn't like the fact that he defended that person, and then some people that were upset that they weren't, he, they weren't, he wasn't taking their side on things, and then the conversation was, we need to make this person completely irrelevant. Like, who says something like that? Like, what kind of intention is behind someone saying something? What is in the state of someone's heart, if that is the way that they are looking at their Muslim brother and sister? These are vices. And unfortunately, is that modern technology, for the most part, has compounded people's that unleashing that of vices on the world. 
and that it is something that is very severe, that we need to have taqwa of Allah, and that to think very carefully before we make a post, is this from my nafs? Is it not from my nafs? Do we think that all of a sudden, that because that technology has changed and the world around us is quote unquote progressing when it's really digressing, and that we can somehow all of the traditional principles about the way we do things go out the door. Is that the people of the science of Ihsan say is that when you want to speak, remain silent. And when you want to remain silent, speak. Now just imagine if people applied that principle to hitting enter and that are published on Facebook. That when you really want to say something, right, just wait and don't say it. And then when you don't want to say something, say it. Because if you really, really want to say something, the sign is, is that it's from the nuts. And this is why they've always talked about that when that the three degrees that determine our actions is that the first one is, is that the shudya. Is that you have to know the sacred law. And that once something is within the realm of permissibility, even if there's a difference of opinion, there's room. But that's not the only criterion. That's the basic level of criteria, and that's the basic criteria. The second level is, is that you imagine, would this be something that a righteous person would do? And this is why it's so important. You should have had, and you should have all had regular interactions with good people, so that we imagine those people. Is it, would they do something like this? Would they really say something like that? Imagine, could you imagine, for those of us that have been around teachers, pious people, could you imagine them saying, let's make that person irrelevant? Like seriously, would one of our teachers say something like that? Right? Absolutely not. Of course not. Not if they that reflect even the that slightest bit of character of Sayyidina Muhammad, <laughs> sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the third criterion that they say, which is subtle, and you have to be slightly careful, especially those of us that are trapped in the lower stages of the nafs, the nafs of the marabas, who is that if you really want to do that thing, generally speaking, when we're in that lower level of that nafs and amara, you should wait. And it might not be the best thing for us to do. But again, once you start calling people out on their desires and tell them to hold back and to restrain themselves, you're going to have a lot of people that do not like you. But anyhow, it starts with Sibthalisa having truthfulness of tongue, and that that, uh, that applies to many different dimensions of our life, that including the promises uh, that we make, and one of the discussions that we had over the weekend was what happens when you become angry, and it becomes that much, much, much easier to move away from the truth or outright lie once you become angry. And we talked a little bit about cognitive restructuring, the importance of avoiding that certain words like always and never, because it's on the verge of being a lie. Is all of a sudden you become angry, you never, da, 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 right? You always, da, da, da. And is that really true, that that always happens? Probably not. Maybe a lot, but not always. Is that true, never? Probably not. Maybe, but rarely, but not never. Anyhow, that we have to be aware of these things and that learn the prohibitions of the tongue, learn that what relates to the tongue, and that they also mention other things like, I've told you a thousand times. Really? Like one, two, three, four, ninety, I don't know what, a thousand times? Right? And exaggeration. And that uh, and also that things like Someone calls and you don't want them to know you're there. Tell them I'm not here. If those are your children, you've now taught your children how to lie. Now, there's other ways around it. You don't necessarily have to answer the phone. You can either not answer the phone or you could, you could just simply say that, um, can she call you back later? Can he call you back later? Or something like that. There's other ways around it. And we have to be careful with innuendos, which is what is known as a, uh, that, um, that are or misleading expressions, things like a ta'arid, because that you can use it for a haja, for a need, uh, but you do have to be a little bit careful there. And that's where you're kind of in a situation where that you need to kind of get out of it, and that you, 
if you told the absolute truth that it would that put you in a compromising position, but at the same time uh, that you can't outright lie. And um, you know, this is an example going back to someone uh, asking uh, if you're there or something like that. And um, or actually, the classic example is that when the good Imam was asked about <coughs> you know, the created nature of the Quran, and that he counted on his hands that the that the Zabur and the Torah and the Injil and the Quran, they are all created. And he meant by that his fingers and not the books. Right? That's an example of a misleading expression. Anyhow, that Sibta Lisan is important, putting that energy in to have truthfulness of tongue. But then there's five degrees after that. So as difficult as it is to control our tongues, that every successive degree is more difficult than the first. Not that we panic, but we realize is that like anything else in life, is that we need to restructure the way that we approach our lives to take these matters and make them the most important matters in our life. The second degree is Sibtaniya. And this is where that truthfulness overlaps with sincerity. And that is that striving to be sincere. And sincerity is a process. And the reason it is a process because all of the manifestations of insincerity relate to passions or the caprice of the soul. So there are attachments to the world. Every attachment that we have to the world potentially could lead us to be insincere in that particular way if we let that particular desire get the best of us. But understanding what the nature of sincerity truly is, if you want to get right to the point that the essence and the highest degree of sincerity relates to two things. One of them is awareness and the other one relates to the motivation. The awareness is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala absolutely deserves to be worshipped. He deserves to be worshipped. The That motivation is in Tithalya you're doing what you're doing to fulfill the command of Allah. That is the essence of what sincerity is. And that if that's in someone, that when you go through difficult times, because the vast majority of us, when we experience the vicissitudes of life, we have ups and downs, we're happy and we're sad. And when we're happy, we tend to have more energy to worship, and when we're sad, we tend to have less. And that when you have the motivation behind your worship be fulfilling Allah's command with that awareness that He deserves that worship, you've detached it from yourself. Because suddenly with it, when you're happy or sad and you let that affect you and you stray from that intention that was just mentioned, is that you are in a sense worshiping for yourself. But when you detach that, that you recognize this is for Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that what you're doing is is that you are preparing yourself to be able to move to the higher degrees of sincerity. You could also say is that it is to have the only intention behind your worship be a desire to draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That takes time though to really truly attain. And the beauty is, is that according to Imam al-Azadi, is that depending upon the degree of sincerity versus insincerity in the heart, is that it's like a proportion that cancels it out. So if you're 75% sincere, 25% insincere, subdue so the subtraction, and then you get 50% of the reward for what you do. Is that if you're 40% insincere, 60% sincere, you still get reward for 20%. And then in the other way around as well, if it's 70% insincere, 30% sincere, is that there is that less that punishment involved as a result. And so we should strive to be sincere. The third level is that beyond the intention, which is what is called sit al-azam, having been truthful at the level of resolution. And that resolution differs slightly from the intention. The intention, the place of it is one of sincerity. But resolution is where that intention becomes so strong, now what you're doing is setting yourself up to actually do that act. And so resolve is important, and that it is that something that needs to be there in order for us to fully that carry out the intentions that we make. And in that process of decision making, is that everything begins with a thought. And then after a thought, that you have what is called the man, is that the way that you incline or 
that disincline, if that's even a word, towards that thought. And then the third stage is, is where you do give hukum, is that you judge that thought and that inclination with your intellect. But your intellect has to be fueled not only with knowledge, well, you could say most importantly with sacred knowledge, and then also experience. And then intention comes at the fourth degree. So it's thought, inclination, judgment, intention. And then you could say in a sense, consider a fifth step or a that further, uh, a final step that relates to that fourth step, which is azm, resolution. And then what you have after that is action. And so is that being that being truthful in our azm. And what azm is really about is mustering up within yourself that ability to actually do what it is that you've intended. And then you could really kind of consider these very closely related, maybe even the same degree. But the third degree, excuse me, let's see, this is the fourth degree now, is what he calls that as silk fed wafat bil azam. Is it where you are truthful and you fully carrying out everything that you've resolved to do. And you will see this, that, that we will we, we will experience this constantly in our lives. We attend the khutbah, <coughs> that something impacts us, that we make an intention <laughs> to that really make that a part of our life. But all of a sudden you go out to lunch after. And then you start spending time with people. And those strong intentions that you made in the khutbah by Mughrib time, khalas, there's no trace of it left. And this is where truthfulness comes in. Is that you might say, I want to donate some money to this particular cause. And that you're there and that you're in the moment that you've decided to do it. And then subhanAllah, is that? You go home, you start thinking about all your bills and college and medication and everything else that you have to save money for. And then uh, maybe I'm not going to donate to that particular cause. And actually say that a very small percentage, really, of the total donations, and I've heard numbers, Allah, I don't they're really true, but it is that known for anyone that has been uh, tried and tested and had to do a fundraiser, which the Holy Quran courts have been other not fun things to do, is that that a actually a relatively small percentage of people that make pledges actually go through with their pledges, and that anyone that put on fundraisers you can ask them that, and and that's a, a very that's a very commonplace. But if you're truthful, is that if you set out to do something, and money is just one aspect of that. Whatever it is that you set out to do. Is that you hear the subhanAllah, the saying salawat upon the Prophet 500 times a day could change your life. And that then you make an intention to do that, but you have to have resolution, meaning that intention has to become strong. No, I'm really going to do that. And part of resolution is where you go through the planning phase of how you're going to do that. So not only am I going to, I'm going to take the time to, okay, I know what I'm going to say. And I know that I'm going to get myself a rosary so that I can actually do it with my subhat. And I know that I'm actually going to do it at work when I'm walking from wherever my car to my office at such and such a time. And then that fourth stage relates to that day when you actually are there in that situation that you do. And so that this is a part of truthfulness. And if you think about your own state and our own states, there's a lot of things that we hear that we want to make a part of our life, but because we're lacking in this trait, is that it doesn't become a part of who we are. There's two more degrees as well. The fifth degree is what is called a sidku fidaman. Is that where we are truthful that in all of our deeds, all of the acts that we do. And what that means is, is that you give 100% of yourself to whatever it is that you are doing. Is that every ability that you have to give to the moment is that you give into that moment to whatever it is that you are doing. And so that if you're listening to a khutbah, is that you give 100% of your intention. Is that with all of the etiquettes, inwardly and outwardly, is that you that, that recognize is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making that person say what it is that they are saying. And that you, that I quote, you follow the that instructions of the Qur'an and that you that, um, that listen to what is being said and that you implement the very best of it. 
And so that even if that some things that are said that you might disagree with or that you don't fully understand what is being said or whatever, is that still don't let that blind you from the good that might be in it. Even if you heard something repeated 1,000 times, is that see it as a gift from Allah to you that you needed in that particular moment. And that listen very carefully and attentively and so forth and so on. The same thing goes for the prayer. The same thing goes when you visit the sick. The same thing goes when you spend time with your family. That live in that moment. And that try your best to give all of your energy to that particular moment. This is what is known as Sikhun al amal And in the highest degree of all is what Imam Wazari calls a Sidku fi maqamat al Being truthful in the various stations of the deen. Being truthful in the various stations of the deen. And what he means by the stations here are the maqamat al the stations of certainty. So the station of repentance, the station of fear, the station of hope, the station of patience, the station of gratitude, the station of renunciation, the station of trust in Allah, the station of love, the station of contentment, all of the different stations of the deen. But when we say those words, is that the hope is, is that as we've grown and progressed in our deen, is that we learn about them. Because the reality is, is that we should have learned about them when we are children is that the very first text that I was blessed, we've been speaking much of today about, that uh, Sheikh Khutri, when Beba, our blessed teacher, that, uh, that really someone who's like a father from Mauritania, and the story of him being brought here and teaching and so forth, and that that initial class has started that, uh, in uh, Santa Clara, which it comes to translating, and alhamdulillah that uh, recently I was able to get copies of the recordings that I had, but every single, was 22 lessons. We had every single one, except one, I lost somehow. And then I remember that I was on my way to Syria in 1999, and as a poor student who barely got on that plane after having borrowed money, that I couldn't take my baggage on because I was overweight. And um, that, or I had to, uh, anyhow, I couldn't take the baggage on, so I couldn't take it on. So I, I put it in a locker and asked a friend to pick it up, and he never did. And oh my goodness, I had so many precious things in there. Among them were those tapes. And um, for years that I didn't have, uh, that uh, didn't, didn't know anyone else that had recorded them. And then recently someone had sent me my lot busted. And now we have that uh, digital version stored in the cloud somewhere. That hopefully, that uh, we should probably do hard copies of it as well. But anyhow, that this is something that you study in a very basic primer. This is what we studied in the last section of Ibn Ashra. You learn about the Muhammad al the Yaqeen. This is far high knowledge. This is knowledge that is an, an individual obligation for every Muslim to know that these things exist. And then you spend a lifetime trying to inculcate them within yourself. But the knowledge of them is extremely important. And that to be thinking about these things and to be reminded of these things. I would love to see that a khutbah series is that for the next running three months, is that every week that they're doing one of the muqamah uh, and, and these are the type of things that we really need to be exposing ourselves to. Everything that we just mentioned about Sidq, these are the six ways that we fight the entropy of the soul. Is it by that putting this energy in, in that particular way? And that this is the way that someone becomes a Siddiq. Is that when you master all six of those levels, is it then that you have attained a very high station in this deen? And you will be beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we look more specifically to some of the verses in the Quran that relate to healing, is that we know that our Lord says, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, Is that we reveal this Quran that as a healing in mercy to the believers. And so that the Quran is a shifa. This is one of the that names of the Quran, is a shifa. It is a healing in and of itself. And it is a healing in a number of ways. The foundation of all healing that lies at the realm and that lies at the level of the spiritual. And although there are multiple different types 
that of healing that can take place is that the most important in the heart of all healing it has to lie at the level of the heart and the soul. If we, no matter how healthy we are in every other aspect of health, is that if the heart and soul is not healthy, it is not considered to be true health. And that we can look in this regard at multiple dimensions or degrees of health. And we can talk a little bit about the following. Is that you have spiritual health, which you could also say is religious health. And then you have another that unique category, which is that rational or intellectual health. It's a separate category. There are some people that are not rationally healthy, they're not intellectually healthy, meaning is that their minds are weak. They don't know how to think properly. They don't know how to examine things. That They don't know how to draw conclusions. They don't have insight into matters. It's a specific type of health, then, that there are ways and tools that you can learn to go about strengthening that your rational ability so that, that you attain more health, that you become healthier that in this regard. And then you also have a, another distinct category of psychological or mental health. And perhaps you can include the emotional in that as well. It's a, it's a distinct category in and of itself. Is that there are such things as mental illnesses. It's not always gin. There is such thing as a mental illness. And that there also is a distinct category, obviously, physical health, which is we can't relocate health merely to the physical, but it is a very important dimension of health. But then you have two others that are exterior to the human being. You could talk about social health. Is it you'd be surprised that someone is spiritually healthy, they're that you know rationally healthy, psychologically, mentally healthy, physically they're doing great. But they just they're not don't know how to interact with people. <laughs> they don't know how to interact with their spouse. They don't know how to interact with their children. They don't know how to interact with their neighbors. They don't know how to distinguish between someone who is struggling in their name and someone who is that firmly the root in their name. They don't know how to interact with that people that might not be Muslim. They don't know how to interact with people that are struggling. They don't know how to interact with people that have had trauma in their life, and so forth and so on. This is an enormous category is that social health is a distinct type of health. And that learning how to interact with people, and that how each person we interact with is unique, and learning techniques to that come to to understand that person that is before you, and how that you're going to deal with that person, and what it is that you say to them, and what is the intention behind it, and so forth and so on. That is a distinct category of health. And then finally, is that we have environmental health. Is that, again, this is exterior to the human being, but there's no doubt that it affects the human being at oftentimes many of these other levels. If you put someone in the wrong environment, is that it could affect them drastically spiritually, it could affect them drastically rationally, and that psychologically and oftentimes even physically. So anyhow, that these six different degrees of health is that when we talk about the foundation the most important part, which is the spiritual health, is that we've always recognized is that there are degrees of the soul. Some of them say that there are three, other than, others say that there are seven. But there's degrees, and the more that we move from the lowest degree, which is the nafs and amar of soup, the nafs that incites the evil, and that we work on ourselves, and then that we move up to the nafs and lobama, the reproachful soul, when we start to stake, our stake ourselves to, to account, is that we're not content with our state, that we want to do better, we want to get our things together, is that then we will be that healthier. And then that it ends, if you say that there's three, in the nafsa mutma'inna, the tranquil soul. And then if we're going to add the other four, because we said some say there are seven, that some say that there is a substage that between that sub two days two and three, which is the nafs and mulhama, the inspired soul. And then some say there are three stages after the mutma'inna, which is the radiya and the mardiya, the one that is that pleased and well pleased. And then you have the nafs al kami. This is the the complete soul. This is the one that is that moved up to the highest degree of purity. And that this is someone who that there are each one of these stages is that there's signs and characteristics, signs that someone is actually in that stage, 
and characteristics of that particular stage that then manifest in the human being as a result. And so that we can't have a discussion about spiritual health without understanding that the soul. And that unfortunately we as well can not have a discussion really about progress without understanding progress of the soul. There is absolutely no meaning to any type of material, scientific, or technological progress without progress of the soul. No meaning to it whatsoever. It will lead to utter chaos. Is that the more we quote-unquote progress in some of those areas and others that we didn't mention outwardly, but we're not progressing at the level of the soul, is that it will lead to chaos, and it will be destructive. And that, in fact, is that the things that we see happening around us that are signs of the time that we live in are telling us something. They're telling us something. Is that whether it be nature itself and everything that we see happening in nature, or whether it be that what's happening on the hands of men and women as a result of what they're, the things that they've done. These are signs telling us about the nature of the soul of something is wrong. But is that we have to relate it back to our own, that understanding, which is one of progress. And so, that in order to truly have that spiritual health, is that there's a few things that we have to take into consideration. The importance of living a life of meaning. And when we say that, we know that we've been created for a purpose. But what does it really mean to live a life of meaning? At the most esoteric spiritual level, it's the way that those who are, have attained the higher degrees of perfection in this religion is that the essence of living a life of meaning is to perceive that the meanings of the manifestation of the names or attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala around us. And even though that's a state of unveiling that in the higher degrees of this of, of that realization, is that we can begin that by taking the first steps in the right direction. And this is why that when we that talk about we actually did a class here years ago on the nine nine names of Allah. And that the hadith of our Prophet Sallallahu that speaks of the nine nine names, Man Ahsaha Dakhala Jannah, whoever enumerates them that will enter into paradise. There's three levels. The first is, that could legitimately be considered to be enumeration, is to memorize them. That's level one. At least we should all memorize the nine names of Allah. Either that in, just with rote from that Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, and Malik al Islam, and Hayman al or is that in poem form, there are poems as well that have put the nine names in poem form that make it easier for us to memorize. Um, but the second degree is, of enumeration is that we understand its meanings. And so that you systematically learn the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what they mean. And then that is preparing you for the third level of, that, of this, which is that you take the share, you take on the share that is possible for the human being. And then it can even get further, where you talk about the different degrees of that, right, of ta'alluq and ta'alluq and ta'alluq. These are amazing things to talk about. And that it shows us again and again and again is that how much work we have to do in this regard. But what happens is, is once you come to know the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can start that training yourself to see them and striving to see the world in that particular way. And to be reminded of that when something happens that you don't like, is that what's, go what's really going on? That maybe there's a name of Allah manifesting that I need to learn. And so that's the essence of living me. And um, I remember that uh, being on a trip one time with my teacher, and we were on our way to Indonesia. And it turned, well, excuse me, we were actually on our way from Indonesia to Australia. And he had had a visa. And that visa had expired. And we didn't realize it in, in, until it was too late. We were in the, we were, went from Jakarta to Bali, and then they looked at the passport, and the visa had expired. And so I was a bit frustrated with the organizers, like, you didn't have the common decency to look at the passport, you know, to see that if there is, if it's still valid or not. And um, 
that my teacher was sitting on the bench, <coughs> and he was just completely relaxed. And keep in mind, we'd come from Jakarta to Bali, which is a distance. And you know how that is, is that when you're getting ready to travel, and then all of a sudden you don't travel, it's very hard for you. Your plane is delayed, or you actually miss your plane. That's not an easy thing to bear. And so we're sitting there, and I noticed that he was just completely relaxed. And I just start looking at him, and then he starts reciting poetry. And then that he starts reciting poetry that is that very, that special poetry with meanings of the love of Allah and so forth. And there was a bit of thought even, you could tell that he was in a very beautiful state. And I think he noticed that myself was in a bit of a different state as I was sitting over there. And that he looked at me and he says, he says, Yahya, he says, that the knowers of Allah, the Arifin, he said, is that they witness Allah, that in giving, they witness Allah when He gives and when He prevents. They witness Allah in times of giving and in times of prevention. And they said, and He said, that they actually see prevention as a gift. And then He says, this is the only thing that you learn on this trip, He said, it would be sufficient for you. That to learn how to, that see prevention as a gift. Wow. What an incredibly amazing concept. That if you could really that see that blockage that you come to a crossroads in your life and just something you <clears throat> can't get beyond that. But you see it as a gift. SubhanAllah. It would it, that would be life changing if you could if you if we could implement that. Um, anyhow is that that learning to that bring meaning into our life in that particular way. But also, too, that the secret to healing at the level of the spirit is to realize is that, that the, the self is not the center of the universe. Is that we, we, we have to that realize <laughs> is that, that even though human beings have this incredible ability to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that you can never truly know your Lord is that when the focus is on the self. And this is one of the greatest gifts that we can offer to the modern world, really, is to de-emphasize the focus of the self. And that there is a long discussion that we could have on how is that the traditional view that many religious people had that was destabilized and ultimately uprooted and changed such that the human being, and really what we mean by that is the nafs of the human being was placed at the very center. And that there, through a trickle down effect, that many of the people that are operating around us, this is the way that they view the world. And that we have to put things in their proper place. And then, there's no doubt, both of those dimensions will ultimately lead to the decision making process of the human being, which is that essential for us to have this spiritual health. And if we would go into more detail about the, the other that, um, that aspects of health is that there's a lot more uh, that could be said about that. Um, and um, But is that the, the, the Quran and the teaching of our Prophet Sallallahu is that they have been sent as a shifa. They have been sent as a healing. And um, uh, I had quoted this hadith before, but I want to remind ourselves of it because I really believe it is an incredibly important hadith for all times, but especially our time. And uh, this is the hadith that, that creates, a, that gives us a metaphor of the believer being like a bee. And um, that I want to quote the longer narration, which is in the Muslim of Imam Ahmad. And um, that it is, you'll see what is mentioned here is that it's mentioned in the context of the signs of the end of time. So, in other words, when there is turmoil, that when things are going wrong, that when things are not the way that they should be, how should the believer be? Right? I didn't mean to say the believer be, and then the believer should be like a bee. <laughs> but that this is what our Prophet says. Inna min ashrat al Indeed, from the signs of the end of time or indecency. And you could translate the second one, although it's the same root word, people going out of their way to be indecent. So there's some people that are just indecent. 
But then there are other people that see other people being indecent, and they go out of their way to being indecent. And they end up being more indecent than those who are just indecent. And if you've traveled the world, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. There are people that, that just want so much to be a part of this world that they think other people that are living is that they go out of their way to be like that. And they end up that being that that more difficult to deal with oftentimes than people who are just indecent and kind of let other people be. Because people that are going out of their way tend there's you know a uh, that um, uh, that way that they end up treating people who are not indecent, that ways that even people that aren't like that do. And then the Prophet said, Wusu al jiwab is that there will be a lot of bad neighbors. Waqatar Arham and a severing of family ties. And then look at this one. That people that are really treacherous is that they will be trusted, and people that are trustworthy, they will deem to be treacherous. And so everything is that upside down. <coughs> is that the true people that have this trait of trustworthiness is that they won't be trusted. And that people that really shouldn't be trusted are trusted. I mean, how many people in the world does that apply to now? If you really think about it, you think about people high up. I mean, we know what happened last Friday. And we know people that are in charge of you know, very serious things. And are these the people that really should be in those positions? Like, what are their intentions? What are their agendas? What are their ulterior motives? You know, and what is their character? That what is their just common decency? Forget character. What is just common? Where is their common decency? And so that this is a sign of the end of time. But what does our Prophet say? In this hadith, he gives us that two metaphors. The likeness of a believer in these times is like a piece of gold. That it was put to the fire and it became more pure. And when it was weighed, it didn't diminish. So again, the idea that we've always heard is that testing relates to putting fake gold upon the fire, which will that expose its fakeness, whereas true gold will become more pure. But then the Prophet said, and the likeness of a believer is like a nahla. The believer is like a bee. And look what he said. He ate from the pure and wholesome things, and then he excreted and emitted that which was pure and wholesome. And that in the another narration is that the Prophet said that waqa'at, <laughs> yani it landed in this sense, like on the pedal or whatever it is that it is taking the pollen from. Falam taksir walam tufsid. It didn't break the petal, right? Nor did it spoil the flower. In other words, is that that what is our prophet teaching us? Is that in situations where things have just gone awry and things are crazy, is that be like that be. Focus on the beauty in things, focus on the good in things. That try to acquire like the be is that the best of everyone and everything that is around you. That try to that understand the best of every possible thing that happened to you in relation to your experience of the divine decree. Try to find something beneficial for yourself in relation to that divine decree and something that will bring about uh, benefit to you. And it's a very profound hadith you know, about the, the, this metaphor of a human being being uh, like the bee. And that if we implement these, the teachings of our Prophet Sallallahu it will lead to that extreme good in all of our lives, and it will bring about felicity in this world and the next. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, give us tawfiq and open up the doors, uh, goodness for all of us. And, um, you know, I really believe as we move forward as a community that uh, really in any time, but especially in our time, is that we really need to create uh, spaces where people can come to heal. And we need to have a discourse of one of healing. Is that there's a lot of pain. And that you might think that everything's okay because people come and they put on their best clothes and everything seems okay when we sit quietly in the room. 
but there's a lot of pain. And the more and more that you come to find out about people that you think are totally normal and balanced, like, wow, there's a lot of pain and there's a lot of suffering. And that even though we have a lot of freedom here in that a place like the United States of America, that there is a lot that people go through, that especially those that convert to this religion. And that even though they might be stable and fine for five years, but at the 10 year mark or the 20 year mark or the 30 year mark, you never know. That when things of your past are going to come to the surface and resurface and how they're going to resurface and what that's going to that do to you. And this is why it is absolutely essential is that we never, ever, ever forget the big picture. And that big picture is, is that every single one of us is in absolute need that, of healing. And Allah Ta'ala is the healer. That is the Dua of our Prophet, Allah Murabbal Nas, Al-Habil Nas. And that in this beautiful dua that our Prophet taught us to say that when someone is that physically ill, that oh Allah, Lord of people, that remove that all illness and that cure that this person and that there is no cure except your cure. There is no healing except your healing that bless this person with a cure that leaves that no sickness whatsoever uh, and no pain, no sickness and no pain. And um, you know, I really believe that this is very important that we develop a discourse of this, that we develop that a way of teaching the community that is rooted in this and so that people can come into that, whoever they might be. And it's likely going to be a very diverse environment. People have different levels, people have different levels of commitment and so forth, but everyone should feel, everyone has a right to feel that they are welcome to that move towards a healing of the soul if it is indeed something they want to do. And like anything else, is that you could go to the best doctors, you could go to get the very best that treatment, but you have to take the treatment. So that our job is to create the environments for that to happen. And that the, each individual has to make the decision to put themselves in that environment. And that really when I think about the blessed places that Allah Ta'ala has that stolen from His grace allowed me to be, is that they're like spiritual hospitals. And everything around them is set up in that way. And that you would be surprised at the, the states of people, that where they're at and how that they come. And that, you know, alhamdulillah, that we can never ever allow the situation to cause us to lose hope. Uh, we have to maintain that hope and that inshallah as we do this, inshallah ta'ala Allah will accept us and that the beauty is, is that if Allah ta'ala, that once they heal us, we will become healed. And the most important type of healing is at that soul level, level and that then, that as we transition from this world to the next, and that inshallah, become purified and that receive that the great gifts that the Lord has in store for the believers, that alhamdulillah we won't remember that all of the pain and suffering that of this world except in the way as a that really that hidden blessing behind all of the difficulties. May Allah Ta'ala give us to we can bless us all of our affairs and reward everyone in this community and that bring us together time and time again. May we all take a path of healing and heal all of these levels of Idna Ta'ala. May Allah Tabaraka Ta'ala reconnect us back to our fitra and bless us all to attain everything that we desire, more than we desire. May we achieve the that greatest goal possible in this world and the next. Connect us all to our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who is the Thibbit Qulub Adilaika. He is the healing, the healer of the soul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the cure of them. Wa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad Alaihi Wasallam. الحمد لله رب العالمين